Our experiment this week in lab is going to be a stoichiometry experiment. We've got a series of stoichiometry experiments at this point in the semester. This week our experiment is going to look at stoichiometry and follow a reaction by conductivity. In order for a solution to conduct electricity there has to be some charge carrier present. In the case of an ionic solution that charge carrier is positive and charged and negatively charged ions so we need to find a way to measure how many ions relatively speaking there are in a solution now we're going to be using probes that give us a bunch of information but really when we're measuring conductivity if we really want to just look at conductivity of solution we don't need anything all that high tech it turns out we can pretty effectively measure the conductivity of a solution with something very simple. This is nothing fancier than a light bulb and the way it's been wired up it's got two bare wires sticking down. So if there's something between these wires that can conduct electricity when it's plugged in the light bulb will turn on. If there's not any way to conduct electricity between these wires the light bulb won't turn on. Depending how conductive the connection is, the light bulb gets brighter, the light bulb doesn't get as bright. So we could measure conductivity with this if we had a good way of measuring the intensity of the light. And there are ways of doing that. Now this room is fairly bright and since we're looking at light it might be easier for us to follow what's going on if we go to a little bit darker room and see what we can do with this light bulb. So why don't we take a walk over to another room and see what we can do. Alright, we've gotten to a room where we can get a little darker, make it easier to see the light bulb on our conductivity tester. So, what do I have? Well, I've got two samples right now. I've got a sample of just deionized water from the lab, from the taps in the lab. And I've got another sample of water that I've added some salt to, something that will dissolve and form ions. So, let's take a look at what happens with those. Okay, we're plugged in, and if I put the wires into that water, not very exciting. Nothing really happens. So that's the deionized water. No conductivity means no ions. It's deionized, just like it's supposed to be. Now, whenever we're using any sort of a probe, this is fairly low tech, but when we're using a probe, anytime we move from sample to sample, we always have to be careful about contaminating things. This just came out of deionized water, so I'm sure it's fine, but it's always good practice to be a little bit overcautious rather than undercautious. So I've just got a squirt bottle with deionized water. I'm going to spray that down, shake off a couple extra drops, and now I know that my probe, I know that my detector is clean. So let's take a look at the salt solution. All right, here's our salted water. So what happens when we dip in that one? Oh, all kinds of light. So there's plenty of conduction going on in that solution. The salt solution conducted a lot more electricity because what? Because it can. There are ions present. There are things available in that solution that can allow electricity to pass through it. So. That's sort of the basics of our experiment. Now, one thing that consistently causes some problems through this experiment, through a number of other experiments that we do, is water choice. There's reverse osmosis deionized water available in the lab. That's clean, as we saw. It doesn't conduct for this experiment. Deionized water has been treated to remove most everything except water. So it's a pretty pure, pretty um, clean water source. What about tap water? Now the big problem that comes up over and over again throughout all of our experiments, somebody will have data that looks a little bit funny, we're not really sure why the data doesn't look good, and fairly often it turns out, well, because we used the wrong water. So let's take a quick look 
I have a beaker here of tap water. I just filled this off the cold water tap in one of the gen chem labs. So what about that tap water? Well, let's test the conductivity of the tap water. All right, now for tap water. Let's get in there and, well, the light bulb lights up a little bit. Not nearly as bright as for the salted water, but it still lights up. That tells us there's still some conductivity. So tap water must have some residual ions in it that could potentially affect our results. So make sure that when you're doing an experiment, any experiment, you are using proper water, proper blank. That's really what this is. The reason this experiment works, the reason we can get useful information out of this experiment, is because we can trust that deionized water that we've got in the lab truly is blank. It does not have any appreciable conductivity compared to the other solutions we're measuring. So make sure you're always using the correct blank, the correct water in most cases, for the experiments that we do. All right, let's go back to the lab and see what we're going to do with the conductivity probes in there. All right, that was a qualitative look at conductivity. We looked at conductivity as you know, just a matter of more or less none. But in order to do our experiment, we would like to be able to quantitatively look at conductivity. And in order to do that, we need like I said, a little bit more sophisticated instrument than a light bulb with two wires dangling under it. So what we're going to be using for our experiment is, well, it's more sophisticated, but in some ways it's really not. Because these conductivity probes that we have in the lab are, well, they're just a fancy version of two wires dangling down. And instead of the intensity of light of a light bulb, they're actually just reading the electric current directly. So in some ways, fancier than a light bulb and wires, but really functionally not much different than, than that. So this is our conductivity probe and the rest of the equipment for this experiment. We're going to be using burettes. Um, if you haven't used burettes before, and maybe even if you have used a burette before, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at the other video that's online about how to properly use burettes. A lot of people use burettes, they don't always use them properly. So make sure you take a look at that. Um, and we've got the setup here. So let's take a little bit closer look at some of the details of what we're working with on the bench this week. All right, let's take a little bit closer look at some of the equipment we're using. First of all, what about that conductivity probe? Let me disconnect it from the computer so we can take a look at some of the important points on the conductivity probe. First of all, there's a little adapter box in the middle. This is one of the things that's mentioned in your lab procedure. In order for this experiment to work correctly, there's a selector switch here and that selector switch has to be set to the proper range. So let me see if I can get close enough to actually see that. You can have it set at 0 to 200, 0 to 2000, or 0 to 20,000. For our experiment, we should have it set at 0 to 20,000. So if that's in any of the other positions, just flip the little switch on the selector up to where it needs to be. What about the probe itself? I said the probe really isn't that high tech. It's, it's really functionally a pair of wires that's measuring conductivity. So if we look at the probe body itself, there's the top. Down at the bottom of the probe, you see there's just an opening that's got, well, it's got a little metal rod sticking out into it. So that's really all there is to the probe. When we're using these probes, now, they are somewhat fragile um, compared to a lot of the other probes we've got. They're fairly rugged, but you know, respect them, be, be fairly gentle with them, but um, you can dab them dry with a paper towel when you're moving from solution to solution, and it shouldn't be a problem. They should behave themselves pretty well. So let me get this hooked back up. 
because now I want to go in and start up the computer. So let's take a look at what we have to do to get things started there. Okay, so to set up the computer, we need to get logged in first of all. Then there should be a chemistry and physics folder on the desktop. Open that folder, go to the chemistry lab folder, and in the chemistry lab folder, there should be an experiment called conductivity one. That's the experiment we want to do. Double click that and it will launch a program called Logger Pro. We're going to use Logger Pro for a lot of things throughout the semester and throughout the year. So it'll take a minute for that to boot up and load and looks like it's in good shape. Conductivity reading is live up here, conductivity reading is live down here. Um, if it comes up, sometimes it'll come up with a little error box saying that the range switch is set to a different setting than what's specified in the program. Tell it to use the sensor setting because the sensor is set correctly. So there we go. We're set up. We're reading conductivity. Right now the probe is in air. So this is, you know, this is essentially zero conductivity. It's not really conducting anything. Okay, so we've got things started. We need to calibrate the probe before we can use it. So in order to do that, I'm going to need two points. One of them is going to be zero, deionized water that has no conductivity. The other one is a conductivity standard. So let me grab the deionized water. Most of the probes that we use, most of the readings that we take are going to require that we calibrate the probe that we're using first. So to calibrate this one, we're going to first look at deionized water and then we're going to look at a standard. So when we want to calibrate, we have to go up to the experiment menu. Once we're on the experiment menu, we go down to calibrate and this will show any probe that's connected to the Lab Pro interface. For most of our experiments, we're only going to have one probe connected, so you're only going to have one choice. We need to calibrate the conductivity probe, so let's click that. And now, let me zoom in on this just a little bit. There is the calibration box. So we want to calibrate now. This is a live reading. Now, this is reading out in voltage. We're reading conductivity. The units for our standard down here, microsiemens per centimeter, are not these units. So this tells you what the sensor is seeing right now. This is going to be a calibration unit that we use. So first, let's take our probe and pop it into some deionized water. And that first data point is just going to be deionized water. So I can take my conductivity probe, put it in deionized water, swirl it around a little bit. I've got it in deionized water. You see there's no voltage reading, which is good because this is deionized water. There shouldn't be any voltage reading. It doesn't have anything in it, so its conductivity should be zero microsiemens per centimeter. So click zero or type zero, click keep, and now it's going to open up the second box. Now what about the standard? We've got to switch over to the conductivity standard and we need to know the conductivity of that standard. Otherwise, it's not a very good standard. So, here is your conductivity standard. And again, I'm going to come in, see if we can get a good look at this. On the label of your conductivity standard, the conductivity is listed. Otherwise, again, it wouldn't be very useful. So, let me see if I can get close enough to actually see that. You see that it's, it's a sodium chloride solution, conductivity standard. And underneath that, the concentration is 500 milligrams per liter. The conductivity is 1,000 microsiemens per centimeter. That's the number you need, 1,000 microsiemens per centimeter. 
when I put the probe into the 1,000 microsiemen per centimeter conductivity standard, you see that now we're reading a voltage because there's some conductivity. The amount of conductivity that corresponds to this voltage is 1,000 microsiemens per centimeter, as it says on the bottle. Click Keep, and now we're done. So, click Done. All right, our probe is calibrated. Now we can go ahead with the experiment. I've already dispensed the chemicals that we need to use. So here is the barium hydroxide solution that we're going to use. Let me slide that up onto there. And why don't I move things around so that you can take a little bit closer look at the experimental setup. Okay, I've got my barium hydroxide solution. I've already filled the burette, including the tip, with sulfuric acid, and I've taken my initial reading. My initial reading is 1.36 milliliters. So now, I mounted my burette clamp up high enough so that I can get this other clamp in. I need to clamp my conductivity probe in. Now, think about what's going to happen. I'm going to have a stir bar stirring in here, so that solution is going to be going around and around in circles. I want the solution to be able to pass through the center of the conductivity probe. So, if I want the solution to pass through that conductivity probe, I should orient my conductivity probe in a way that solution will flow through that opening not hit the side of the probe that doesn't have a hole in it. So let's get that mounted in an appropriate way and clamp that in place. So there's the first thing we've got to make sure that we do correctly on our setup. The other thing we've got to be able to do is, well there are a couple things. First of all, make sure everything's lined up so that you can actually use the burette, turn the stopcock on the burette without bumping into this clamp. That might take a little jockeying around. The other thing is stir rate. Now, some of these stir plates are a little bit pickier than others. Anytime we're stirring something, and it doesn't matter if it's this experiment or any other experiment we're doing, we want to be stirring fast enough to effectively mix the solution, but not so fast that we're pulling a bunch of air in. So if you turn it up really fast, and I'll do it for a second just because I want to show you, if we're stirring really fast, and some of these can stir really fast, on some stir plates, you can start to pull a little vortex of air down, and if that vortex hits the stir bar, it shoots bubbles all over on the inside of the solution. For this experiment specifically, if we got a bunch of bubbles in our solution, it would really negatively affect our results. So we definitely want to be stirring, and we want to stir fast enough to stir, but if you see a vortex starting to form in the top of the liquid, probably need to slow it down a little bit, otherwise your results are going to be a little skewed. So, there we go. Let's go ahead and get this first data point on the computer. Alright, now that my conductivity probe is in the sample, you see that I'm reading a conductivity for this particular one, 7500 microsiemens per centimeter. So now we're ready to start our experiment. First thing is to go up here and click collect. So when we click collect, you see a few things happen. First of all, a dot appeared here because we're collecting data right now. The collect button changed to a stop button and we activated this keep button. For all of these experiments, it's very important whenever you have a data collection like this with the keep button, once you start, do not click stop until you've done everything you need to do because for some of these experiments, once you click stop, you're probably going to have to start over if you haven't collected all your data correctly. So always make sure you are really completely finished with the experiment before you click stop. 
but for now we're okay so right now we've added you know, look at your axis down here we're going to keep track of total volume of acid added right now we've added a total of zero we haven't added any acid at all so let's go ahead and keep this first initial point come up here click keep and the total acid added at this point is zero click OK you see that dot moved over so that our first data point is now at zero volume of acid we can move on but before we do let's take a little look here the axis is scaling in this case all the way up to 20,000 my data is down at just under 7500 so that's a little too large of an axis so I need to change that there are a couple ways to do it one way is if you watch my arrow if you get close to the axis it'll change to either a bar with an arrow pointing up if you have that one you can click and drag and it'll leave the bottom of the axis in place and let you stretch the top if you're more towards the middle you'll get a two-ended arrow this lets you move your whole data block up and down but it doesn't change the size or if you're closer to the bottom you'll get a little dash with an arrow pointing down this one holds the top of the of the axis steady and lets you stretch or compress the bottom of the axis for most things that works pretty well um, if you need to make a big change you can also go up here and if you click on the highest number on the axis we can just enter a number so let's enter 8000 that sets the top of the axis at 8000 down here I want to set the bottom of my axis at zero so same thing set it at zero now we've got a little bit more appropriately scaled graph alright there's my zero point now I said my initial burette reading, my burette reading way up at the top was 1.36 milliliters. I want to add about a milliliter. It really doesn't matter how close to a milliliter it is. All that matters is that I keep track of that. So I'm going to go ahead and add some acid to this. And now my burette reading is 2.14 milliliters. So if my initial was 1.36 milliliters right this is how we have to use a burette my initial reading 1.36 milliliters I just did an addition so now I'm gonna read it again I was at 2.14 milliliters so how much did I add I added the difference between those two So my first addition should be 0.78 milliliters. That's what I'm going to input on the computer. So let me put that in. That's my first data point. Let's go to keep. I've now added, if I look, 0.78 milliliters. So 0.78 milliliters has been added. Click OK. It just collected my second data point. I can do another addition. So again, I'm using a burette. If I'm using a burette pro properly, first of all, I should be estimating to the second decimal on all of my readings. And now for my second addition, I've got a total volume of, and it's easier to read burettes sometimes if you've got a consistent background. So I'm just going to hold this behind the burette while I take my reading. It looks like 3.45 milliliters. So after my second edition, I'm at 3.45 milliliters. Initially I was at 1.36, so... The total for my second edition 
is 2.09. So from the initial, from the very beginning, to this point, I've added a total of 2.09 milliliters. Let me go ahead and enter that. Keep that time I added a little bit more, but remember, we're looking at the total acid added since the beginning of the experiment. So at this point, I've added 2.09 milliliters of acid. So there's my next point. Now the other thing you have to make sure you do is don't just rely on numbers. You've got eyes, you've got ears, you've got a nose, you've got all kinds of senses to help you out. Make sure you're jotting down any changes you see here. You may have seen some changes as I started adding. When you're doing your experiment, you should also be recording any changes, anything funny that you see going on, anything that might be a problem, might lead to some sources of error in your experiment, or just might help explain what's going on in the experiment you're doing. So we can continue this experiment until, as it says in the procedure, we collect at least six to eight data points beyond the minimum absor or minimum conductivity that we read. So that's how we're going to work through the experiment. Again, you're not entering the incremental amounts that you add each individual time. You're adding the total acid. You're entering the total acid added since the beginning of the experiment. So make sure you're entering this correctly. If you're not sure, after you do two or three additions, call your lab assistant or your instructor over and have them look at it. We can fix things after two or three additions. If we're at 30 or 40 additions, yeah, you're pretty much out of luck. So make sure you're entering that data correctly. Your graph will appear on the screen as you do your data collection. So that's our experiment. Um, we're going to measure conductivity. If you get good data, you probably only really have to run this experiment once. Um, conductivity data is usually reliable enough that it looks pretty good the first time through. If you don't have good data, well, then maybe we'll have to rerun some things. Um, the best way to avoid getting bad data is to make sure you know what you're doing and if you're not sure, Make sure you ask questions because we can usually fix things if you ask questions early. If you finish up the whole experiment and then discover that your data collection wasn't very good, about the only solution is usually start back at the beginning. So that's this week. A couple of little safety notes for this week. First of all, as it says in the procedure, the acids and bases that we're going to be using are relatively relatively dilute, but they're still strong enough that they could cause some problems, cause some damage. Sulfuric acid specifically is very, very good at eating holes in cotton. So denim is the enemy of sulfuric acid. Um, if you get something, if you spill something either on you or on the bench top, everything cleans up pretty well with water. So. If it's a small spill, should be able to just clean it up with towels and water, shouldn't be a problem. Make sure you just wash, wash well with water um, with anything you do. The other things that we've got to think about are um, what to do with our waste. We're going to have waste buckets available in the lab and make sure you put all of your waste in those waste buckets and clean up your glassware pretty well. You're the only person using your drawer. Your group is the only group using your drawer. So any mess that you leave behind, you're going to have to deal with next week. So make sure you do a good job of cleaning up your dishes before you leave lab this week because it's almost always easier to clean up glassware when it's still wet and, and easy to clean up rather than to let it sit, get caked on, and cause a problem later on. So that should be lab this week. Make sure you take the quiz before the deadline, and we'll see you all in lab.